Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. Uh, welcome. Uh, welcome back. Uh, my name is Ann Kinseth. I'm the Director of Education at the Meadows Museum. Um, and we are thrilled to kind of with this Q&A session, kind of move to the, the second half of our course. We're almost halfway through. Um, so before we get started, I just wanted to remind everyone that we are recording this session. It will go on our course page and eventually it will end up on the museum's YouTube uh, channel. I also would like to ask um, everyone to keep themselves on mute throughout this session so that we're not picking up any um, unnecessary background noise. Um, and finally, um, our presenter today has uh, put together something to address the questions that were submitted in advance. But throughout uh, the Q&A today, if you do have additional questions, uh, please use the chat box and, and type them there. And should we have time at the end, uh, we'll address as many of those as we can. Um, so I would um, now like to hand uh, the session over to Dr. Amanda Dotsett, who is the curator at the Meadows Museum. Good morning and welcome all to our third uh, live Q&A for this wonderful series, Curator's Choice. I hope you're all enjoying it as much as I am. Uh, this lecture took us to London and one of my personal favorite collections and favorite um, works of art in, in the whole world. Um, I think we all, on some level, you expect to hear about Belathka's, let's say, um, when we think of the National Gallery in London. So I was delighted that our speaker, Akemi um, Erreith Vosbrink, picked um, a personal favorite of mine. Um, and so I'll just reintroduce her briefly. She's held some wonderfully prestigious fellowships at the Getty and uh, was a key participant in the Meadows Museum's co-organized with the Frick um, exhibition on Zubaran um, on the series of Jacob and his 12 sons. More recently and more pertinent to this lecture, she was the um, CEEH curatorial fellow in the Spanish paintings department at the National Gallery where she was a key member of the team together with Leticia Treves, um, working on this wonderful project in collaboration, partly with the Prado for this exhibition, Bartolome Bermejo, Master of Renaissance Spain. It was an exhibition that was held in 2019, a very focused um, exhibition that brought together key pieces. And of course she addressed that in her lecture. Uh, I will also just mention that Akemi is currently completing her PhD at Cambridge. And just as a note, <clears throat> she should be completing that PhD very, really quite soon, um, hopefully defending it <clears throat> within the next few months. So everybody, um, you know, touch wood and think positive thoughts for Akemi in this final uh, stage of her thesis process. Just to give you a sense of the order of events here, Akemi has gone above and beyond and created a wonderful PowerPoint for you all. Luckily, your, your wonderfully insightful questions kind of grouped naturally into three themes. And so we will roughly follow, um, um, we've roughly, or she's roughly organized her answers into provenance, restoration, and patronage. So I, we will be monitoring the chat box, but if your question pertains to something that's later on, we may wait until she gets to that and I will be jumping in as requested. So please take it away, Akemi. Thank you so much for submitting your questions. It's wonderful to talk to you uh, live actually. Um, and I prefer, prepared a little presentation that goes beyond what I said um, in, my present, in my presentation. Uh, so I thought that something most a big group of you were curious about was provenance and how, for example, altarpieces got uh, dismantled and where they ended up, specifically the Master of Riglos one, because I didn't actually, the Pere Garcia, the Navarri crucifixion, um, that came from Riglos because I didn't go that much into detail with that one. I mostly talked about St. Michael because it's the one I worked on the most um, for the National Gallery project. But your questions were wonderful because then I went into depth 
on the crucifixion and found uh, quite interesting photographs of how it was and when it was dismantled and the fascinating provenance of this crucifixion. So I just want to start you off on how um, one starts conducting this kind of research. So basically, it is very important, especially if we know where these um, altarpieces came from, um, to look at the um, archives of the churches, convents, or monasteries. No? Um, and these will often include detailed inventories indicating what objects were there at a given time. Um, sometimes they will even record when said altarpiece was sold. Uh, and sometimes, unfortunately, these were replaced um, by other contemporary examples or they were even destroyed. So very often it's very difficult to keep track of their movements. Uh, if we were lucky and the altarpieces were kept in their location until the 19th century, and 20th century, uh, as we see with Bermejo and Pere Garcia de Benavarri's altarpieces, there were several possible recent reasons that led to their dispersal and subsequent sale. One of the primary factors was the confiscation of church property called desamortización, which, were, which was um, especially prevalent throughout the 19th century. This was not the case, though, for um, Bermejo and Pere Garcia de Benavarri's altarpieces, which were probably sold from their respective churches by priests to dealers. Um, so now I want to, because I discussed Bermejo at length and its provenance, um, I want to move on to the case of the uh, Riglos altarpiece uh, in which Pere Garcia Benavarri collaborated. Uh, what is fascinating about this is that it comes from a very small uh, hermitage church dating to the 11th century in the town of Riglos that's under this incredible kind of rock formation. So you can see the fascinating landscape. And this is just in the north of Spain, close to the Pyrenees, actually. Um, so we are fortunate enough to have photographs of the interior and what it looked like. Um, in the early 20th century when some of the altarpiece was still there. So what happened is we see in the photo on the left, you will see that the altarpiece is actually already fragmented. It was, it was already dismantled probably in the 16th century and inserted in this classical 16th century frame, wooden frame. So it's very interesting because what we know nowadays might not actually be the entire altarpiece, just fragments of what survived. Uh, so curiously, this photo was taken in 1909, uh, but in 1917, someone went back to the church and took photos and the paintings were gone. You can see actually that there's a, a sculpture of St. Martin in the middle where the painting of St. Martin would have been. And he's flanked by pretty recent paintings of the Virgin and Child and St. Anthony of Padua. So what happened between 1909 and 1917? Here's where we will unravel the mystery. Um, so here I tried to reconstruct with color images so you get a better idea of the different components that remained from the altarpiece. I remind you that obviously these were dismantled and not all of them were kept. Um, and it's very interesting because they were probably sold either in groups or separately. So we would start actually with one of the paintings which you will see in the bottom right corner uh, which is the death of St. Martin from the Pinacoteca Nazionale uh, in bon Bologna nowadays. This one was a, probably the first one to leave because it was already recorded in Bologna in 1910. So uh, apparently records say that an Italian dealer had acquired it and that's how it reached Bologna. So what happened next? Then it is possible that the next one to leave was uh, the St. Martin sharing his cloak, the painting in the middle you see here. Uh, apparently it was acquired by some dealers until it reached the hands of the Catalan collector Luis Planidura, who was based um, in Catalonia and he would then donate the painting to Barcelona's Manac Gallery, uh, so where it remains today. 
and as I uh, mentioned before, this was done by Granien, who was the master of the whole composition and uh, who was the master of Pere Garcia Benavarri. So this was a collaborative piece. So then what happened to the other paintings? Um, so the rest of them must have left between 1909 and 1917, between the two photos I showed you. And they uh, actually ended up with the English dealer, Lionel Harris, who had them in the Spanish Art Gallery in London. Um, the National Gallery crucifixion that you see above uh, was actually acquired by Jewish merchants from this gallery in London uh, and taken to Vienna, where it was subsequently sold to a British diplomat in 1928. So this is important because this was before Second World War and all the reattribution, all the issues that happened um, during that period with uh, Jewish collectors. No? Um, so it returned to the UK actually. And um, this collector called Richard Storrs then subsequently bequeathed the painting to the National Gallery where it remains today. And finally, the remaining works were acquired by Erich Galleries based in New York. Um, so you can see the fascinating provenance of this. Uh, so as you see there, like to the sides, there are two uh, kind of panels that are connected still by part of the Gothic ornamentation. And these uh, ended up in Hearst Castle in St. Simeon in California. And actually, if you go nowadays, you'll see them hanging above these magnificent uh, medieval beds. Um, so if you go, watch out for them. Um, and then finally, the last piece of the jigsaw in the bottom left corner is a vision of various saints uh, that St. Martin had. And this one was actually acquired by Albert C. Barnes. If some of you have been to Philadelphia, he has an incredible museum, which includes mostly well known for its 19th century paintings, such as Renoir or Cezanne, but it actually has a prominent um, medieval collection of medieval objects that is not very well known. Um, so yes, um, I wanted to just basically reconstruct the provenance. I hope it wasn't too confusing. And I hope by having the titles and where they're located, you can kind of situate how they moved around across time. But now I want to mention uh, one of you, uh, Eugenia Vigil, also asked whether Spain has a process of reclaiming these works and whether they are returning to their original locations. I will pass actually this question to Amanda. She has worked on this, especially in relation to the monastery of Sigena. So um, the easy answer to the question is, um, Yes, Spain has, well, they, primarily they have a system to block export of certain objects. Those are objects that are still in Spain. For things that have already left, it's obviously a lot more complicated. There could be claims to things if there is proof that they left their place of origin after the appropriate laws were in place blocking their movement. Um, to my knowledge, there haven't been any major um, major cases or major litigation. Um, the, there is a kind of famous example of the frescoes from San Bardelio de Berlanga. Of course, we have two on loan from the MFA Boston in, in our galleries. Um, they've been on loan to us for many years now. Um, others of those frescoes, like this, this altarpiece that Akemi is talking about, are all over the world, quite frankly. Um, but in one famous case, um, the frescoes that were in the possession of the Met in New York were returned to the Prado and they're there now. I think they're officially called something like permanent temporary loan or something like that. I don't, I don't think they were technically deaccessioned by the Met. They're just kind of permanently on loan to the Prado. Um, because the process of, of restitution and deaccessioning is what it is, but it was very, is very difficult. So this was a kind of good faith um, attempt. Um, 
those of you who've heard um, any of my lectures on the um, Adoration of the Magi by the Master of Sikhenna that we recently acquired at the Meadows, um, I have talked a little bit about the restitution issues regarding that altarpiece. But in that case, that isn't for um, an object that's outside of Spain. That's actually a restitution case between two different um, autonomous communities within Spain. So in this case, um, Sihena, which is in Aragon, requesting to have um, objects returned from Catalonia, and specifically, in many cases, from the museum in Lleida, and also from the Manac, which is one of the museums that Akemi mentioned a panel from this altarpiece is from. So long story short, it's easier to control things once they're already physically in the country, and then you, there, are, there is a process and committees for granting or not granting export permits. But once things have already left, um, it, it gets very complicated. And, you know, Akemi has shown you a beautiful example here of how you trace the provenance of things by piecing together archival material, photographs, um, even third, second or third kind of removed references to dealers or people seeing things. It's very complicated. Um, but in theory, at least, if if you could prove that something left after um, the artwork or the monument it came from had been declared national patrimony, um, there could be a claim. There just hasn't been any high profile ones that I personally know of besides say those um, uh, Romanesque frescoes I mentioned earlier. Thank you very much for answering that, Amanda, um, in so much detail. This is wonderful. And I thought um, we could now return briefly to another question uh, related to the crucifixion by Pere Garcia de Benavarri. Um, so many of you asked about the pointed halo that appears and the figure of supposedly Saint Anne to the far right. And I'm afraid there's no straight answer to this, actually. Uh, sometimes uh, it's not as simple as that. Um, I think one of the possibilities for having this different shape halo is emphasizing how unusual it was to have Saint Anne in this crucifixion. I mean, she's not typically represented in these scenes. Um, this same artist, Pere Garcia Benavarri, painted other altarpieces where she appears with his pointed halo, her husband, Joaquin, and also Joseph, the Virgin's husband. And perhaps this is a symbol of age. Sometimes in other altarpieces, it's a symbol of an Old Testament figure. In other altarpieces, uh, it's randomly um, ornamental for certain saints. So there's not a kind of hom homogeneous approach to this. So I just wanted to say, I'm sorry, I don't have a straightforward answer, but hopefully uh, this will make you reconsider why these um, halos were used in different cases. I also got the question of, oh, sorry, Amanda, did you want oh, to? Oh, I was just gonna jump in and, and yeah. emphasize that Akemi and I actually did discuss this. <laughs> And you know, it's funny, um, some things, these, these questions that seem kind of straightforward are actually the hardest to explain just because they're from one altarpiece to another or one workshop to another, things really aren't as consistent as we'd like them to be. But I, but I love the idea of an iconographical, iconographical um, solution, so. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's very interesting. I mean, it's uh, fascinating that figure of possibly St. Dan to the right, uh, far right. So, and then the other question you had is why is there a partially obscured figure to the far left? Um, and she's actually one of the Marys who was holding the Virgin Mary when she fainted after seeing her son crucified. She could either be Mary of Clofas, Mary of Jacob, Mary of Salome. It is not easy to tell. What we do know is that the Mary in, with a red cloak um, kneeling next in, in prayer next to Christ is Mary Magdalene. So we have this distinction with the long hair no, that she used to wipe his feet before. So there are certain, the Marys, the other Marys are done in a more kind of generic way. So it's difficult to identify which one of them was it. 
and they also appeared in the scene of um, uh, the entombment, no? They came with ointment jars, so they're kind of recurrent in the biblical passages. Um, so now, um, without further ado, I wanted to focus on the restoration of Bermejo Jose Michael, which I was very for fortunate to see part of. And I also saw it before and after cleaning, and it really uh, came out. Um, Paul Ackroyd, the conservator, did an incredible job. As you can see uh, to the left, these are all the losses and the areas that were repainted that Paul Ackroyd basically removed to try to recuperate as much as possible of the original painting. As you see, they're not too extensive, these damages. Most of them um, focus on are on the bottom because there was some flooding in the church actually. So this is this is the area that's most damaged. Um, and also around the devil's face, um, there's a lot of, there are many losses. Uh, what is fascinating is how Paul Curry then approached the restoration process because in most places you see that there are only faint scratches and not major losses. But in the bottom um, right corner, that whole plant you see the, in the middle that I'm showing, the prickly er eryngium, was completely lost. There was just one bit of a leaf visible. So how did the uh, conservator approach this? There's actually the same plant, another, another painting by Bermejo, of the Virgin of Montserrat. So he took it as a model for this plant. And because Bermejo used some type of model no, to recreate these same plants in several of his paintings. So this was very fortunate, actually, that he had this reference point. But in some areas, unfortunately, it is not possible to reconstruct what some parts look like. And this is the case of the jeweled buckle I show be beneath in this detail. As you see, uh, it has this weird brownish appearance. You don't see it bejeweled is the other parts of his breastplate or his kind of armor. Uh, and this is because Bermejo used a pigment called orpiment, which is an orange yellow color that degrades over time. So unfortunately, since he didn't have a reference, he decided to leave it as it was, um, because it's better to not recreate when you don't have enough indicators of what it looked like, no? Um, so it's a balancing act you have to play here with restoration. And one of you also asked um, what kind of pigments he would use. Um, so normally um, this varies according to the institution, but for example, um, in the National Gallery, they normally use uh, water-based solutions like watercolors, uh, which they mix with the, uh, the the pigments needed and this is so it can be easily removed in the future if it needs to um, and also in terms of what pigments are used they try to get as close as possible to the original pigments but if these are organic and as we saw with the orpiment these could degrade over time they will use uh, synthetic equivalents um, so yeah uh, i hope that answers generally um, how the restoration process happened. Um, as you can see, there's the before and after images here. Uh, and finally, I wanted to discuss the patron, Antoni Juan. And here, one of you asked, why would he dress so lavishly? Was he aiming to impress someone? Um, why would he need redemption given his status? Even if it sounds surprising, those in higher echelons of Aragonese society felt that it was especially important uh, to portray themselves praying for salvation, uh, to capture their image for posterity as benevolent exemplary models to follow. Antoni Juan might have even requested that special prayers were given in his honor to guarantee his salvation. By being actively recognized during mass and as the local knight of toes, his image would have been well known to the locals, which was his main aim, actually. Also, the question of salvation and da damnation was strong in medieval Spain, as there was a prevalence for last judgment scenes that slowly disappeared in the subsequent centuries. As St. Michael determines the destiny of many of those judged, it was especially apt to depict Antoni Juan praying for St. Michael's favor then. 
uh, yeah, um, I think that was it. Please let me know if you have other questions. I'll be glad to answer them. I'll, I'll just jump in and add that um, kind of in general, one of the kind of key functions of, I mean, we, we treat these objects like paintings and works of art and that sort of thing. But one of the key functions of these um, images is they are participant in religious ritual and in, in the mass. So a patron inserting him or herself, we have examples of both, of course, um, visually into this image and then of course that being accompanied as Akemi was saying with with um, active kind of prayers um, and and this is this is part of what patronage meant it was giving money or giving objects or land in many cases to religious institutions to ensure these prayers for their soul right so what I love about this is in this image, I'm, um, w the image in this case has lasted longer than the prayers. <laughs> and, and, and we have, even at the National Gallery in London, a, a, a decidedly secular institution, um, we have this wonderful human who is in perpetuity praying to St. Michael, right? I mean, um, Anyway, you want some you want some longevity for your immortal soul. I think commissioning art's a good way to go. <laughs> so, Kemi, we do have one question um, from Mary. Could you tell us a little bit more about your doctoral thesis, what you're working on? Yes, um, I actually my doctoral thesis is a bit later than this period. I focus more on the 17th century, but you have to be flexible. And I focus on the Spanish artist Francisco de Zurbarán. Um, and the paintings he sent to the New World, uh, mostly in around the 1640s and 1630s. Um, and it's very interesting because he had connections, especially in Peru, where uh, several of his paintings still remain. Um, you can actually see them. Or what is interesting is many of these were also painted by his workshop. So, we get a greater understanding actually of the kind of collaboration bet between Zurbarán and his workshop in the New World. So I've been looking at the, how these paintings reach their locations, uh, what was their importance in colonial society, what were the trading routes and how they got there, and what was the appeal of evangelizing and focusing on the New World, no? Because there were so many monasteries, comments that were being recently funded. Um, and needed to be decorated in, in, let's say, series of canvases of female saints, of patrons, I mean, of founders of religious orders, apostles. So that's what Zurbaran and his workshop did. They exported masses of paintings like these. So okay. we just have a couple extra questions here. Um, one is, I'll answer a few in the chat box, but um, one is, could you talk about the decorations on top of the crucifixion? Is it wood carvings or mixed metal materials? Yeah, no, it's, it's very interesting, actually. Um, so basically, the, the wood carvings are, it's all done with wood, but then there are some, uh, there are several layers, no? Uh, so the decorations uh, were overlaid. Sometimes they're done with bowl, which is like clay um, uh, in some areas and where you apply the gilding. But then you also carve some sections like the Gothic elements that come out towards you. So there's an amalgamation of this. And then there's also sometimes gesso, no? And this is where you get the more manual kind of technique. So you have a real combination of all of these. And then you have to remember that these weren't done of a single plank. There's several. So these are united on the back um, with bolts and so forth. So it's quite a complex structure. And the types of woods also varied. In Spain, it was very typical to use pine, for example. But in the north, it was more oak. So this is quite interesting in terms of technical research. Um, another question, perhaps our last, is could you comment on the church's designation of St. Michael as both saint and angel? 
Yes. <laughs> and um, I'm happy to jump in <laughs> if you need, if you need it, Gabby. Yeah, no, um, it's quite interesting because uh, St. Michael um, had this special importance actually in Valencia. It was greatly venerated and there was a great veneration for angels and archangels as protectors and defenders and there were different hierarchies of these, no? Um, and St. Michael was almost like St. Mark for Venice in, in Valencia. He had a special veneration in a way. Um, so it, it is suit, suiting that they would choose St. Michael to kind of the, the, the saint for this parish church. Um, and it also demonstrates this preoccupation with the last judgment that's quite prevalent at the time. Um, but yes, I don't know if Amanda, you would like to add anything or? Um, so St. Michael, I, I mean, I think there's a few kind of issues going on here. Um, one is that he, he, his kind of key role as a psychopomp. So this is this kind of key role in, in, as it can be said, in the last judgment, but also in the kind of weighing of souls and his kind of, his role in the apocalypse. So he's not a saint the way that um, earthly saints were saints, if that, if that makes any sense. He's not a saint the way that, um, say, uh, Saint Vincent Ferrer, uh, who of course we have a painting of in our, in our galleries, who was an actual human who lived on earth and um, was reputed to have performed miracles and all this. This is a kind of saint that exists in a different realm, um, in a heavenly realm, and always has. Um, but did was known so there were miracles attributing attributed to him when people prayed to him say for recovery from illness or plague um or he would in, he would intervene in certain situations um um so it's but but never was never a kind of living breathing um human on earth let's say thank you man well, I'm going to step in, I think, um, to, to formally close our session as we are a few minutes over. Um, so Akemi, thank you so much um, for all of the work and really for, for really embracing it um, right as you kind of joined us at the Meadows Museum. This has been such a great way to start a Friday. Amanda, thank you for, for moderating. And I want to thank everyone for, for being here with us this Friday. Um, on Monday, our next lecture will post. We'll be officially in the second half of our course, so we'll be hearing from Dr. Bray, the director at the Wallace Collection. I also wanted to remind everyone that we do have a very rich page of recommended readings, so if you haven't seen that already, there's um, recommendations and there's also um, links that you can click on to download the PDF. Um, and then finally, I will be posting uh, a recording of, of this session and I'll, I'll make an announcement so everyone knows where to find it within the course. So thank you all. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you next week. Thank you all for joining. <laughs> see you soon.